What is our universe made of? A stage, space-time, and actors, which are galaxies, stars, planets, stones, boats, cats, jumping spiders, and much more. All these things are made of matter, and matter has mass. Because of this, it bends space-time around it, and anything that passes by will slide along the curvature of space-time. We call this gravity. We do not see space-time physically. This is why we have the illusion of a force, the gravitational force. The path of light, for example, that is normally a straight line in a flat space-time, appears curved when it passes close to a mass. By looking at this curvature, we can back-calculate how large that mass is and where it is located. So, by studying the bending of light that travels across the universe, we realize that gravity is much stronger than it should be when we just account for the matter we can see. It appears there is too much gravity in our universe. What is going on? Well, the most consensual hypothesis is to evoke the existence of a dark matter of some kind. It would be stuff with mass that only interacts gravitationally, and according to very recent findings, maybe also with itself, but certainly not with normal matter or light. This is why we cannot see it, thus the adjective dark. As for the word matter, it is a little bit of a stretch because we have no clue what it is, so we cannot really say that it is matter. What we can say is that whatever it is, it has the same effect than mass, it generates gravity. Dark matter is a mystery, and the first step in solving a mystery is to investigate. So let's look at the facts. As far as we know, dark matter only interacts gravitationally. So all the techniques we use to identify its existence are linked to observing its effects. In this video, we are going to focus on one of them, the rotation of galaxies. We will look into the other techniques like gravitational lensing or analyzing the CMB in future episodes. What are galaxies? Galaxies are groups of stars which are bound to each other by gravity. These are huge structures made of billions, up to hundreds of billions of stars, all orbiting a central supermassive black hole. For example, the Milky Way, our own galaxy. It's 100,000 light years across. It contains more than 100 billion stars, which all orbit Sagittarius A. Sagittarius A is a supermassive black hole that weights about 4.3 million times the weight of our Sun. Many galaxies have a spiral-type structure, like the Milky Way, or Andromeda. Yeah, Andromeda is the closest large galaxy to us. It's kind of the Milky Way's buddy. And when we look at the internal structure, we can have a simplified view of it, which will allow us to understand the dynamics of the galaxies. We can see the internal structure of a galaxy like a traditional town. At the center of a little town, there is usually a religious building, like a temple, a mosque, or a church. Then around it, you find buildings stacked close to each other. These form the city center. Further away from the city center, the buildings are more like houses separated by gardens and parks. These are the suburbs. In a galaxy, it's a bit the same thing. The religious building is a supermassive black hole around which all the stars of the galaxies are in orbit. The stars in the core of the galaxy are so close to each other that they are strongly bound gravitationally. That means that if you manage to move one, the others would probably follow. Yeah, it behaves a little like a solid where each star would be an atom. Move a part of the solid and the rest comes with it. And then you have the suburbs. 
where the stars are much further away from each other. Hey, that's where our Sun is. And the bond between these stars is quite weak. Of course, this vision of a galaxy divided in zones is very approximate. Yes, the star density gradually changes with the distance to the central black hole. But here we are just trying to get a model that is close enough for its predictions to be meaningful. What we are going to predict with this model is the shape of the velocity curve. A velocity curve is a graph that represents the speed of stars versus their distance from the center of a galaxy. For that, let's pull out the board. I represented here a galaxy seen from the side and seen from the top. You recognize the suburbs, where the stars are kind of far from each other, the city center, where they're all packed uh, so much that they are bound to each other, and the dot in the middle is a supermassive black hole. From this model, I want to predict a velocity curve where the velocity is the velocity of a star, and r here on the x-axis will be the distance of this star from the center of the galaxy. Where is our sun? Well, our sun is actually in the suburbs. It's at a distance of around 28,000 light years from the supermassive black hole. So let's try to figure out what would be the velocity of a star located in the suburbs. Well, why is it in orbit in the first place? Ah, because of gravity. So that's the orbit of the star. And the gravity that's ongoing on her is defined by a force, which is proportional to the mass of the star and the mass that is causing the gravitational field. Therefore, the mass that is located within the orbit of the star and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the star and the center of mass. Notice that we are neglecting the mass of the stars which are outside of the orbit. They are negligible compared to the mass of the stars inside. Okay, we are assuming actually that um, the star is in circular motion. Yeah, it's a reasonable assumption, but it allows us to say that the gravitational force is a centripetal force. Therefore, it is expressed as mv squared over r. And we can equate these two expressions. That allows us to cancel the mass of the star and cancel one of the radiuses. And we end up with v squared equals gm over r, or v is square root of gm over r. gnm being constant, v is proportional to 1 over square root of r. vr. We can draw our predicted velocity curve. That would be for the suburbs. Now we want to figure out the velocity curve for the stars which are located in the city center. Remember that in the core of the galaxy, stars are very close to each other. Therefore, there is kind of a gravitational bond between each other, and we can consider, as a very rough approximation, that the core of the galaxy is a solid. So let's draw a solid, a solid disk in rotation. What we want to do is to find the magnitude of the velocity of any point of this disk versus the distance from the center. What will be the speed of this point? That is the distance covered by this point per unit time. If the time is a period of rotation, this distance will be just a circumference of a circle 2 pi r. Now notice for any point of this disk, of course, the period will be the same. Therefore, 2 pi over t is a constant. That means that the speed of any point of the disk is just proportional to the distance from the center. That's our velocity curve for stars which are within the core of the galaxy. So we can draw it like this, like a line, passing through the origin because when the radius is zero, you see the point here has no speed. We're done. We just need to draw here the velocity curve of the stars in the galaxy. That was not very pretty. Like this. Now it's time to compare the velocity curve we got from our model 
to the one obtained from observations. Oops, they don't seem to match. The observations suggest a flat velocity curve and our model a decreasing one. According to the observations, the stars at the edge of the galaxy are going way faster than predicted. But at these speeds, the gravitational force is not strong enough to hold the stars. They should be flying off into intergalactic space. But obviously, they are not. Ok, so something must be wrong there. Something is missing. One idea is to say that such a gravitational behaviour is caused by matter we cannot account for. A kind of invisible stuff that only interacts via gravity. By back calculating the distribution of mass from the observed velocity curve, scientists realise that there should be five times more mass than what we actually see. And to fit the curve, the extra mass should not form a disk like visible mass does, but a spherical halo surrounding the galaxy. The idea that there is a dark matter that composes five-sixths of all the matter in our universe sounds crazy. But the thing is, it has been checked out by the observation of so many other phenomena, like gravitational lensing, the dynamics of cluster galaxies, the fluctuation of density of the CMB. And it's not only qualitative, the numbers match. In all cases, we need five or six times more matter to make the universe work according to the laws of physics we know. So much coincidental observations have made the idea of dark matter consensual in the scientific community. Of course, in science, it is really important to always put in doubt the consensus and explore other possibilities. Instead of introducing dark matter, we could try to revisit the laws of physics so that they match observations. Some have tried that approach. For example, the Mond theory does just that, and that works quite well on galactic velocity curves. This is why it has been the main competitor to dark matter for a while. But it hasn't managed to justify rigorously other observations. So now this alternative idea is kind of falling behind. The other observations. Yeah, let's talk about these. They are quite fascinating. But this will be for another episode of Physics Made Easy. So make sure you hit this notification bell so you don't miss it. I hope you enjoyed this video. So please like and subscribe. It really helps the channel and encourages me to make more videos. But in the meantime, I'll see you soon for another episode of Physics Made Easy. Ciao!